Good morning. Sometimes the scripture is long. Sometimes we struggle with pronouncing the words. But today it is short. It is brief. It is clear. And it gives me more time to preach. Amen. <laughs> I'd like to use as a sermonic theme today the season of listening. The season of listening. Beverly Glenn Copeland. I had to go all the way to Ireland to hear the sounds of Beverly Glenn Copeland that quieted the rumblings in me. I couldn't label or confine it to some genre of music, but only receive it as tastefully beautiful. After just hearing one song, La Vita, I wanted to hear more. I reached out to the facilitator of my trip and said, hey, who was that artist? The New York Times two years ago wrote an article on this trans artist entitled, The Listeners Found Beverly Glenn Copeland. For Glenn Copeland, not only was making music a lifelong pursuit, but making music for him was a lifeline. He did it because it allowed him to live. There's some artists that do things for jobs, but then there are other artists and they do it because they have to do it, because it feeds them. It nourishes them, and it keeps them alive. And so he made two albums in the 70s, but a career never materialized. And in the 80s, he began his own private pursuit of tranquil electronic hymns on tiny batches of self-made cassettes. Later, his folk rock LPs emerged as collector items, auctioning for thousands of dollars. But largely, he was unknown. And then a couple of years ago, at 76 years old, a record enthusiast from Japan had an emotional experience hearing Glenn Copeland music. I know all about the emotional experience because I had it too. He called him and said, do you have 30 copies of keyboard fantasies? He had originally made 500 and only sold a couple of dozen, so he had plenty of cassette tapes of keyboard fantasies. So he sent the guy 30 copies to Japan and said, you know, enjoy. A few weeks later, the guy called him back and said, I sold them all. Can you send me 30 more? What Glenn Copeland did not know is that this record enthusiast, Ryota Masuko, was highly influential, sparking inquiries from several labels who have since reissued, reissued Glenn Copeland's self-made music as well as others of his recording. Glenn Copeland is now on the map, map, but guess who's devouring his material? Young adults, people largely in their 20s and 30s, and me too, a little older than the 2030 mark. The listeners found Beverly Glenn Copeland a bottomless well of positivity and light. So this is where we're going to enter the biblical text today. <laughs> this, <laughs> there is so much to do. Anybody want to say amen? One day I decided to write down all the things I thought I had to do, and I typed them up neatly. And what I had was five pages of bullet point things to do. Neat, but not so neat. And one of my clients came in and said, what's that? I said, my list of things to do. She's like, that's crazy. We are moving. Our world is loud and full of sounds and movements. Even in our slowness, I hear people feeling overwhelmed about not having enough time to do what it is they need to do. We have 24 hours, but we need 48. We are busy worrying, and I have seen it tackle all generation, even seniors. We are busy trying to make it, trying to survive, and trying to make meaning of our lives. We are letting fear creep in and occupy space on the windowsills. We are anticipating tomorrow while we are still yet living today. We are rushing to this thing or that thing so much so it's hard just to stay present right here in the moment. Be present in worship. And so Martha, Martha here in the text was rushing, preparing, and getting ready for company. Because that's what you do when company comes over, right? You get your house in order, right? You get it looking like it's never looked before. Houses don't clean themselves. Kitchens don't prepare food. Welcome doesn't happen without some preparation. 
The grass doesn't get tended to and shaped by itself. The litter and debris doesn't go away by itself. Things happen because somebody has to tend to them and Mary wasn't pulling her weight. She was getting quite annoying to Martha. And so Martha told Jesus, tell Mary to get up off her blessed assurance and help out. Ever been working and thought someone else was just standing around? Ever been working hard and feeling like another person is not pulling their weight? You ever been working hard and look at someone that looks like they're just sitting there? Have you ever wondered why others don't pitch in? Are you the oldest child and you always find yourself whipping other people into shape? Or maybe you're an only child or maybe you're the youngest having to prove yourself. What's wrong with Mary? Doesn't she see what has to be done? Have you ever wondered why people do the things they do? Find yourself wanting people to do other things, act in ways that seem more appropriate or at least helpful to the situation. Jesus finally responds. You remember it because it's a short text. Martha, what is bothering you is not Mary. You want me to scold Mary and tell her what she should be doing is helping you. Mary isn't your problem. Martha was Martha's own problem. Often the things we call problems are not actually the problem. The text said she was distracted by many things. Mary was just a person to pour out all of her frustrations on. Jesus promotes in this text listening, sitting, being still. All that other stuff is necessary too, but in this moment, sitting at Jesus' feet and listening is what's important. But it's hard for some of us to sit still. If that's you, just, just confess to yourself or raise your hand. It's hard to sit still. I thought I'd put us in there so you didn't think I was talking about you. <laughs> it's hard for us to stop all the movement and business and just sit still. It's hard not to hide behind work and just be still. It's hard to come to the table and just be present. Some of us are afraid of what we, we might find, the grief and pain that might show up on our doorsteps the fear that might crowd our hearts, the things we may be running away from. Work has its place, but so does sitting with silence and being quiet and opening ourselves up to a visit from Jesus, which can be scary, but it also can be exciting. On July 7th, my workshop facilitator told us we were to be silent and listen. I could already look at one of the participants and tell it was going to be hard for him. We had to eat alone and be by ourselves. We were to have no interaction with no other person for a whole day. I was giddy with excitement to be alone with God. What I heard was the sound of a car and its wheels the rubber making the sound as it came against the plentiful gravel. What I heard elsewhere was the sound of a door, the hinges making a creaky sound. I've often felt the wind, but I got to hear the wind. I heard sheep eating grass. I heard the talk of bicyclists as they bicycle past. And in the distance, sounds being carried of children playing came to me. I heard the creek, I heard the sound of water flowing downstream. And then I heard my grandmother singing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. I was alive and present to the wonder and mystery of God. 
So what about when we don't hear God speaking? What about when we feel like we're all in this world alone? I know one of you is out there wondering, I ain't been feeling and hearing God lately. Renita Wings wrote a whole book about listening to God to talk about when it feels like we don't hear from God, when God feels so terribly absent, when we feel like we're in this thing by ourselves, when we wonder if the voice we hear from God is what we ate last night or is it actually God. And she stresses, keep on doing what you know to be right. Keep on doing what you know to be good until you do. Be faithful to the journey. And I would add, cultivate space. Make a date with God. Put it on your smartphone. Put an alert. Put it on your calendar. And let nothing else trump it. Build an altar, a space beautiful for you and God to gather. Take a day away from others. Lean into one Sabbath day a week where it's just you and God. Read a devotional and then sit still, journal or pray. Cultivate space in your life to sit at Jesus' feet and listen however that needs to happen for you. I think we will be better people. We will be better followers of Christ if we spend more time in the presence of God. We might even leave with a God idea. You know, there are plenty of good ideas in the world, but I love it when I feel like there's a God idea. Yesterday, we were on our lawn. Doesn't our lawn look beautiful? If you didn't notice it coming in, take a notice when you go out. Our lawn is looking good. Yesterday, we were on our lawn and we were working and someone came up with a God idea that we would give plants out for free. Now, what I love about working on our lawn is not actually the work, but I love the fact that we come together in peace and harmony and we do something constructive. We're not arguing. We don't have to do too many church meetings. We just get out there and we use our hands and our hearts to do something beautiful to our lawn. We also got to talk to our neighbors and people coming along, sharing God's love, got to give out plants. And I began to listen because I like listening anyway. And as strangers came by, they fell into a couple of groups. The first group were, they were the Marthas. They walked on by. Generally, if something sounds too good to be true, it is. So they never really heard the offer, or maybe they really thought there was a catch to it. So they were like, I'm not going to get close. I'm not even going to act like I heard you. And they just walked on by. They wanted no conversation at all. They wanted no interruption. They were on their way. Maybe they were busy. But the second group heard. Maybe they were uninterested, too, for various reasons. Plants aren't their things. One person labeled himself as a plant killer. He's like, no, no, I'm going to kill the plant. One guy said, you know, I'm not into plants, but I'll send my wife over. They heard, but they were still not able to receive. But this third and fourth group, what I heard, what I heard as I listened was joy. A little disbelief that someone was giving them something with no catch. They were a little leery to get their feet wet. One grandmother walked by with two grandkids. This past win winter, one of the grandkids had gotten seeds from her school. And in planting those seeds, she had seen them come to life. The grandmother began to recall her days of house planting. All three, her and her two grandkids, took a plant. They sat down on our ledge and they began to talk to one another. And they left happy looking at their plants. And I heard God united, you've done well. Today you've communicated my love is free. My grace is free. My mercy is free. No catch. My joy is free. And then I wanted to be a Martha and say, what else can we give away? What else can we give from our homes? And miss the joy of that moment. Tangible, concrete thing that people could carry and hold and touch and take away and journey with. 
Doing is important. We are looking. I just asked at the beginning of service, could we have people help with media? I've asked for Sunday school teachers. I'm always asking for something as your pastor. Can we do this and pushing? Oh my God, doing is so important. Getting folks to be committed to the work and service of God is important. The laborers are few, says Matthew, and he wasn't lying. So this is not a passage to put down those who work, those who are busy, those who feel purpose. It's about season and timing. It's about balance. Sometimes people of God, we need to be still. We need to be still so we can witness the goodness of God, so we can see the delight of a child given a plant to grow. So we can see the beauty of a smile or laughter of another. So we can hear our own heartbeat. So what troubles us can be honored and released. So that we can see the stroke of God's hand in our life and in our church. So we can remember the songs of our ancestors. So that we can be reassured even when the days ahead don't look all that good and uncertain. That there's a certainty in our Lord, our God that healeth thee that will never leave us. I was with your ancestors and I am with you now so that we can see the wonder and mystery of God. So in Ireland, after this day of silence and listening, we broke our fast of silence and we listened to the wonderful words of Glenn Copeland and I was so ready for those words. And so I end here today with this invitation to enter a season of listening. I end here today remembering how important it is for us to cultivate time and space for God to speak to us, as scary as that might seem. I end with Copeland's words and the music that peered out to us after being silent for a day. I wonder if I'm ever going to get it right. I push and I push to get ahead. I know I got to make my daily bread. No, I don't have time to lose. I wonder if I really have time to choose. I barely have time to shed a tear. I hardly have time to shake the fear. And the body says to me, remember, you got to breathe. The body says to me, take time to grieve. The mind says, let the silence flow. The mind says, allow yourself to grow. The spirit says, cast your eyes above. The Spirit says, fill your heart with love. The heart says, seek the light within. The heart says, let the dance begin. And my mother says to me, enjoy your life. My mother says to me, enjoy your life. My mother says to me, son, enjoy your life. Martha, I can't tell Mary to get up and work, not today. Today she has chosen to be still and to listen, and she has chosen the right thing. It is the invitation to every believer to embrace and enter this season of listening. Amen. <laughs>